So today Mark and I are back at Carkeek Park in Seattle, Washington. And in this little episode, we want to talk a little bit more about symbolizing. So I have three sentences for Mark to symbolize. And I've kind of abbreviated the English because there's not enough room to write everything down. But this first sentence is going to be, it's not the case that if Ann swims, then Bob swims. So the context is someone says, if Ann swims, then Bob will swim. And someone else says, no, that's not true. In other words, it's not the case that if Ann swims, then Bob swims. So how would you symbolize that, Mark? Well, I'd be looking at it's not the case part. It's not the case that it's denying something, and it's denying if. So we have a tilde denying a conditional, denying an if-then statement. And if A, A is going to be the antecedent, B will be the consequence. Here we have the denial of the entire conditional. It's not denying A, it's not denying B, it's denying the if-then conditional. Uh -huh. And the parentheses tell you that the denial is applied to the whole thing, not right. just to the A. If there were no parentheses there, the tilde would just be denying A, in which case English might say, uh, if A is false, then B would be true. Yes. But that's a different statement. Yes. So the parentheses, as you know from reading the course materials, the parentheses form this into a quantity or a whole. And then the tilde is being applied to the whole quantity. That's what the parentheses tell you. Mm -hmm. So we're saying it's not the case that, and then this whole thing is what's being denied, that a, if A, then B. And then what Mark said was, suppose we didn't have the parentheses there, and we symbolized it this way. We understand the tilde to be applied to what's ever to its immediate right. And so now it's, if A is false, then B. And that's different from this. Make sure you see the difference between the two. We have a train, we better move on. Okay. So uh, now I'm saying if Ann won't swim, then, and I'm abbreviating this and shortening it because of space, if Ann won't swim, then either Bob or Chris won't swim. Okay. How would you symbolize that? Well, I'd be looking for a comma. I don't see one in this case, so I have to think a bit more. Uh, we, I know I have a conditional, a horseshoe, because I have an if then. And it looks like the horseshoe is going to be the main connective because the antecedent, A won't swim would make sense. So we'll have tilde A. A would be and would swim. Tilde A would be and won't swim. And the consequence is going to be a statement that makes sense by itself also. In this case, either B or C won't. So either B won't or C won't. I'll put that in parentheses because I want that to be the main connective. So here's a either B won't or C won't, uh, which is different from having the tilde on the outside, of course. Mm -hmm. That's how I do it. Good. So your parentheses here form this into one unit. Mm -hmm. So really you have this and then a horseshoe and then this. So it's this unit, horseshoe, this unit. Right. Which is how the English grammar seems to read because right. someone says if this, then all of this. Mm -hmm. And that clearly makes this, of course the word either clearly forms this right. into a unit by itself as the consequent. And this is perfectly well written and it's not ambiguous at all. If there was a comma here it might have been even easier but it's not needed because you're using the word either mm -hmm. it's totally unambiguous and there's only yeah. one intelligent interpretation. Okay. That's that's a train. There we got a, we got a lot of trains around here. Is that too loud? Does it, we just wait a minute. Yeah, we might wait a lot of minutes here. <laughs> so that's good. so uh, I think it's working. So one thing, the word either tells you these two go together, but we have B and we have C as our subjects. They're sharing the verb won't swim. And so the reason you put a tilde on each of them is that the B and the C are disjoined with a wedge between them, but they're sharing the verb. And so they each get the knot. And that's why you did it that way. I just understood it to saying uh, either B won't or C won't. And you know, stated that way, I would know how to do it. Yeah, pretty which, clearly it's saying the same thing. Which means that you you gave them each the one. Right, right. Yeah. Now the last one. <clears throat> okay, A won't. A won't, but B will, comma, comma. but okay. E won't. I love commas. A well-placed comma is usually helpful. Uh, the comma is right near the word but, which would get an ampersand. So that's a conjunction. E won't would be the right conjunct. A won't, but B will would be the left conjunct. Doesn't matter which I do first. If I start over here, E won't. So E would be, he would swim. Tilde E, he won't swim. Mm -hmm. 
Here we have A won't. It is false that A will swim, but it functions just like and. So I'm going to use an ampersand here also, if I can draw one. <clears throat> but B will. Since that's the main connective, this needs to be one unit. So I'm going to put that in parentheses. So that is the left conjunct of this connective. Well, that is the right conjunct. This doesn't need parentheses because there's no amb ambiguity there. Does that look good? Yeah, in other words, you're saying the comma, there, that's the last one. All right. Now we have a plane. There we go. <laughs> so you're saying the comma divides the sentence in two and makes that a unit and that a unit. And so your parentheses respect that. Your parentheses respect the comma and say, look, that's all one unit, and then that's all another unit, and it's joined by an and or, yeah. or a conjunction. If I see one comma in a sentence, and I have pretty good reason to believe it's a well-formulated sentence, it oftentimes helps me know where the main operator is. If I see a couple commas and I see one semicolon, uh -huh. usually the semicolons are a little beefier, oftentimes that will give me a hint as to where the, the main operator, main connective would be. Mm -hmm. So a little more symbolizing, and symbolizing is based on your knowledge of grammar. You use your understanding of grammar to see how the sentence is divided up, and then you try to have your symbols and your connectives represent that dividing up, or that parsing. Okay, yep. that's good. Thank you.